Well, good morning and happy Easter to each and every one of you, no matter where you are this morning. If you are gathered around a screen right here in the Holland community, or if you are somewhere else, even scattered around the nation, if you are connected to the Grafscop Church community, or uh, if you are a guest with us today, we're so glad to be able to worship together like this. And again, a happy Easter to each and every one of you. It's exactly why we're gathered today, and it is to celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. In fact, that's really why we gather together Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, year after year after year. Because Jesus, who was crucified, who was buried, has risen from the dead. And that is what we celebrate together today. You know, the church uh, across the globe today, the Christian church, the body of Christ, is going to be saying, a, a little responsive saying, uh, again, throughout the world and around the globe today. And I think many of us uh, are aware of this. We know what this is. I would say the Lord is risen and you would respond saying, he is risen indeed. So I know that we're not physically together, but we're together bound by the Spirit. And so I'd like to try that for all of us, that you would respond in that way. After I say the Lord is risen, that you would say along with me, he is risen indeed. So let's give it a try. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, he certainly is. And that, again, is why we celebrate today. Now, you see, next to me, I have a candle. And for those of you who participated in our Good Friday service, you'll know that this is the same candle we had there on the communion table. And it was a candle at one point that we snuffed out uh, when we remembered Jesus suffering, his death, and his burial. But if you've got that candle handy at home and you're lighter as well, I want you to take a moment to light that candle. And as we do that, of course, we acknowledge that this symbolizes Jesus' resurrection, the fact that Christ is risen. So let's hear in song about that right now. Well 
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is with great joy in our hearts that we gather for worship this morning. To worship you, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to lift up the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the one who has saved us, not only by way of his death on the cross, but by his resurrection from the dead. The fact that he did not stay dead in the tomb, but he walked out living and breathing, and he is alive forevermore. Father, that's why we gather with such joy this morning. No matter where we are, and although physically we cannot be together, nevertheless we know that you are drawing us together by your Spirit as the church of Jesus in this place and even throughout the world. And so, Father, we want to join our voices, to join our worship with the worship that is happening around the world today, to lift up the name of Jesus, to exalt him, to glorify him. So, Father, bless this time of worship here together today. And may it be a, a wonderful blessing to each one who gathers, and most of all, a wonderful blessing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, God greets us this morning with these words. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of of the kings of the earth. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to take just a moment, and if you have your cell phone by you there at home, to take that out. We practiced this last week in anticipation for today, and I want you to take that cell phone out uh, just a moment. Look in your contacts. Maybe find two or three people uh, either connected to Grafscott Church or just family members in general, someone that you can extend not only a good morning, but a happy Easter too. So I want you to do that just a moment. And I'm going to take out my phone and I'm going to do that too. And uh, yeah, do two or three contacts there. Just wish them a happy Easter and a good morning as well. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to do uh, two or three of those, and I know those are very much appreciated. It reminds us that we're thinking of each other even as we worship together. So I want to take just a moment and share with you uh, a reading for today. It's a reading called Early in the Morning. Just listen closely. It's a wonderful assurance. Early in the morning. When the world was young, you, O oh God, made life in all of its beauty. You gave birth to all that we know. Early in the morning, when the world least expected it, a newborn child crying in a cradle announced that you had come among us, that you were one of us. Early in the morning, surrounded by respectable liars, religious leaders, Anxious statesmen and silent friends, you accepted the penalty for doing good, for being God. You shouldered and suffered the cross. Early in the morning, a voice in a graveyard and footsteps in the dew proved that you had risen, that you had come back to those and for those who had forgotten, denied, and destroyed you. This morning, in the multicolored company of your church on earth and in heaven, we celebrate your death and resurrection, your interest in us. 
So we ask, Lord, bring new life where we are worn and tired, new love where we have turned hard-hearted, forgiveness where we feel hurt and where we've been wounded, and the joy and freedom of your Holy Spirit where we are prisoners of ourselves. To all and to each, on his community and on his friends, where regret is real, Jesus pronounces his pardon and grants us the right to begin again. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, obviously, today, this Easter Sunday, looks a little bit different than uh, perhaps what we were hoping it would, and certainly what we have been generally used to, uh, Easter after Easter gathering together, obviously physically in this place, and it looks a lot uh, different than certainly what I was expecting it to look like, as I'm looking out over basically empty pews, and, and I know that it's so different and in many ways, that's very disappointing to us. But I came across a, a post the other day uh, on Facebook, and I'd like to share it uh, with all of you. And I think it puts a, a new dimension uh, toward what's happening uh, and what has to happen uh, right now for the sake of what's going on in the world around us. But it really was very thought-provoking for me, and I wanted to share it with all of you. And I hope it, it will be meaningful and give further meaning to what's happening even now, as we gather like this in worship. It's a post from Reverend Lanza, and this is what it says. The very first Easter was not in a crowded worship space, was singing and praising. On the very first Easter, the disciples were locked in their homes. 
It was dangerous for them to come out. They were afraid. They wanted to believe the good news they heard from the women, that Jesus had risen, but it seemed too good to be true. They were living in a time of such despair and such fear. If they left their homes, their lives and the lives of their loved ones might be at risk. Could a miracle really have happened? Could life really have won out over death? Could this time of terror and fear really be coming to an end? Alone in their homes, they dared to believe that hope was possible, that the long night was over and morning had broken, that God's love was the most powerful of all, even though it didn't seem quite real yet. Eventually, they were able to leave their homes. When the fear and danger had subsided, They went around celebrating and spreading the good news that Jesus was risen and love was the most powerful force on the earth. This year, we might get to experience a taste of what that first Easter was like. Still in our homes, daring to believe that hope is on the horizon. Then after a while, when it's safe for all people, when it is the most loving choice, we will come out, gathering together, singing and shouting the good news that God brings life even out of death, and that love always has the final say. This year, we might get the closest taste we have had yet to what that first Easter was like. Well, I thought that was fitting, and it encouraged me, and I hope that it encourages all of you as well. It's marvelous to think that way, right? That we might get just a little taste this year in the midst of these circumstances that we weren't expecting and certainly, in many ways, don't even like. That still we might get just a little taste of what that very first Easter was all about. Well, I'm going to invite the kids uh, to gather around their, their TV or their screen if they're not at this point. I'm going to share a children's message, and again, we're, we're thinking about the jelly bean prayer. So I'm going to make my way over here by these colors that uh, would have been put up week by week uh, throughout the season of Lent. And I just want to go through the whole jelly bean prayer together. We've kind of had a verse here and a verse there as we've made our way through it. But let's look at the whole thing together this morning. So I'm going to read it for you. Thank you, Lord, for these jelly beans that remind me of your love. I started with a sinful heart, keeping me from you above. Red represents the blood you shed to provide salvation free. White shows the cleansing of my sin as I put my faith in thee. Yellow is for heaven above, my new home I'll have someday. Green is for the growth I will see as I read your word and pray. Purple shows you are king of all, the one I choose to obey. Thank you, Lord, for these jelly beans. They mean more than words can say. You know, that last stanza is really important when we're thinking not just of jelly beans, but we're thinking of these colors and and all that they represent. And we know that all of this is true. That even though we're sinful, Jesus' blood purifies us, gives us the promise of heaven, invites us to grow closer to God, and helps us acknowledge that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, that all of this is right and true because of what we're celebrating today. Because Jesus rose from the dead. And you see, Jesus' resurrection is God the Father's great amen to what Jesus did on the cross, that God the Father fully accepted that sacrifice. And now, everything that we know from Scripture about who we are and who God wants us to be and has enabled us to be in Jesus is true. That we can know it. And believe it with all that we are. That's 
the glory of Jesus' resurrection. And that's why we really do celebrate today. So I, I hope that you'll take that into your heart, that you'll celebrate Jesus' resurrection very much so today. And if you were here today, I'd be giving each one of you one of these little packs with the jelly beans and the jelly bean prayer, and I wish I could reach through that screen and give one to each of you. I can't do that, but it'll be here when you get back, when once again we can gather together as the church in this building together, shoulder to shoulder, and this will be the first thing that I give to each one of you. So I hope you have a wonderful Easter day today, celebrating Jesus resurrection. Well, I'm going to make my way back here, and I'm going to invite all of you, if you would, if you have a Bible at home, to take those Bibles out, and we're going to read from the Gospel of John today. Now, it's a little bit of a, a little bit off the track of where we've been. We've uh, stayed mostly in the season of Lent in the Gospel of Mark, and even just a couple of days ago on Good Friday, we were focused in on Mark chapter 15. And Mark certainly does share uh, his story of the resurrection of Jesus. It's there in Mark 16. You can read that for yourself. But we're going to read it today from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. As we've now come uh, through those eight days that changed the world, we're on that eighth day, and we're thinking about Easter joy. So John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And here in God's word, this is what we read. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. As far as we want to read this morning in God's word, and may he bless his word to us today. Well, congregation, uh, a number of years ago, Renee and I had the opportunity uh, to attend a, a conference in Colorado. And as we were making our way to the YMCA of the Rockies, where the conference was being held, we had the chance, or we took the chance, uh, to do just a little bit of sightseeing. And in one little town, uh, I believe it was Idaho Springs, there was an old family-owned mine uh, that was open for tours. 
Now, it was still a, a functioning mine, but it seemed to be a little bit more active for tours uh, than it was for hauling precious metal out of the earth. Well, we thought it might be fun, so we decided to take a turn off of I-70 and follow all the signs to this, uh, this old mine. So after paying what we thought uh, was a little bit too much for a half-hour tour, uh, a guide took us into the mine, and he began to show us around. And it did prove to be a, a very interesting tour. I'd never really been in a, a real mine shaft before, and it, it really was impressive. Everything that goes into to mining for, for precious metals, it's actually quite a, a complicated and even at times a very dangerous process. But you know, what struck me most of all as we were on this tour is that the deeper and deeper we went into the mine, the darker and darker it became. And if it weren't for these little flickering light bulbs on the sides of the mine shaft, certainly at one point we would have been encased in complete darkness. And even with the little light that we had, when we emerged from that mine and the warm, bright sunshine hit our faces, it almost felt as if we had stepped from death into light. Well, you know, following Jesus during his final week, as we've done throughout this season of Lent, is very much like touring a mine shaft. And as you go deeper and deeper into the week, the, the colder and the darker it becomes. And at one point, namely on Friday and Saturday, you, you, you begin to wonder if the darkness and the cold will ever end. But then just before you lose all hope, you, you emerge from that fateful week and, and light explodes and it chases the dark and the cold away and it wraps you in warmth and light. And you see, friends, in a, in a nutshell, that's really what Easter is all about. And on that first Easter morning over 2,000 years ago, the crucified Christ walked out of that cold and dark tomb living and breathing. And in the face of all the hopelessness, God the Father stepped in and he raised his son from the dead. And as he did, light exploded and the cold and the dark were chased away. And there was warmth and there was light. Easter was a day that changed everything. And there's no doubt, for example, that the Apostle Paul viewed the resurrection of Jesus in exactly that way. This is what he says, part of what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which many of us simply know as the great resurrection chapter. Paul says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first or primary importance, he says, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, once again, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And Paul goes on to say, with respect to Jesus' resurrection, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, well, then our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And Paul was absolutely convinced that Easter was a day that changed everything. In fact, as he says, as we, as we take out from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus' resurrection is the very cornerstone of our faith. And in a very real way, our entire faith, all of the Christian faith, it either stands or falls on the basis of Jesus' resurrection a resurrection that happened as sure as the sun rises. As Paul goes on to point out in 1 Corinthians 15, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Death has been swallowed up in victory. You know, the gospel accounts of the resurrection give more details of the event itself. John chapter 20, our text for this morning, I think, gives us one of the clearest pictures of the surprise and the joy of Easter morning. So John tells us in our text that, that Mary Magdalene, 
got up very early on the first day of the week, which of course would have been Sunday, not Monday. Many of us think, you know, Monday's the first day. No, Sunday's the first day of the week. She got up very early in the morning, even while it was still dark, and she made her way to the tomb. Now, John doesn't tell us exactly why she went. We really don't have any details there. There were probably a variety of reasons why she made her way. We do know, as we look at Mary Magdalene in the Gospel accounts, that Mary was personally devoted to Jesus. And there's no doubt that his death on Friday had just shattered her emotionally. And she probably went to the tomb as a symbol of her love and, and her devotion to this man who had done so much for her. And whatever else Mary might have brought with her, there's no doubt she brought feelings of despair and grief. Because after all, death is never a pleasant subject, especially when it comes in such a gruesome fashion as it did to Jesus on Friday. And so as John tells us here, she, she approaches the tomb and she sees this, this large stone which had been placed over the entrance of that tomb that was hewn out of the rock. This large stone was, was rolled away from the entrance to the tomb. And, and as we're reading it, we might think, well, maybe, maybe this will give Mary a clue to even begin to consider a resurrection. But in Mary's mind, this was simply adding insult to injury. I mean, here she's thinking as she approaches the tomb and she sees the stone rolled away. She says, oh, and as she looks in and, and Jesus' body isn't there now, it's not only have they crucified, not only have they killed my Jesus, but now they've stolen his body. You see, Mary went to the tomb on that Sunday morning expecting only to find a dead body. And when even that wasn't there, she, she didn't know what to think. It, the whole thing was just so confusing for her. And there's no doubt that it would have been the same for you or for me had we been in Mary's sandals that morning. So as John says, she, she runs back to town. She tells the disciples what she had found. And we can, we can picture the scene, right? Here's the disciples, and they're, they're huddled together in their homes. And Mary bursts in, and she tells them, I, I went to the tomb, and, and the stone was rolled away, and, and no body was there. And we can picture, as John highlights for us in his account, here's John and Peter, and their gaze locks on each other. And they stand up together, so we're going to go check this out. So they run out. And I love the way that John records what happened for us, right? John always references himself in his gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he says here, we, me, me and Peter, we went out to the tomb. We ran. It's like they had a race. And John is quick to point out that he got there first, that he was faster. And I love that little side note that John gives. He says, I got to the tomb and I, I looked in. Peter got to the tomb, we read. Bold Peter, he walks right into the tomb. Eventually, John is is going to join him, and together they see the same thing that, that Mary has relayed to them, right? It's the stone rolled away, the tomb is empty, and there's no body. So Peter and John, they look at each other, they really don't know what to think. It all hasn't come together for them yet, all the pieces haven't fit. And so as we read, they decide to just go back to their homes. But Mary, for one reason or the other, she stays behind. And just then, writes John, two angels appear at the tomb with Mary, although it seems pretty clear from our text that Mary really had no idea that they were angels. And they ask her why she was crying. And her tear-stained reply, it's short and it's to the point. They've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they've put him. You see, Mary still thought that Jesus was dead. I mean, after all, there was really no reason for her to think differently. She had seen Jesus crucified on that Friday. She had watched as he took his last breath. And for Mary, there was really no reason at all to think that Jesus was alive. What an incredibly despairing time. It must have been for Mary. Can you imagine? Well, I think now more than ever, most of us probably can imagine. 
The fact is we're living in the midst of some pretty despairing times, aren't we? There's an invisible virus that's ravaging the world, many parts of the world. Certainly has impacted and affected our world right here in Little Holland and Michigan as well. Most of us are confined to our homes. I don't know about you, but I feel to a certain extent like I'm under house arrest. I mean, I hardly dare go out to Myers or Menards or something and pick something up. I think I'm going to get somehow in trouble. Schools have closed down. I feel terrible for those students who maybe were eighth graders looking to go into high school and the end of their middle school career, or high schoolers especially, the, the seniors that were looking for all the things that seniors get to do, and, and ultimately uh, graduation. The college students who were looking to graduate feel terrible for those students. And churches obviously are closed. I'm looking at a, a bunch of empty pews here, although I know so many are, are watching uh, through a screen. There's empty pews here. Churches are closed. Businesses are are boarded up. People are worried about ultimately losing their job. People have lost so much income. We don't know. We have no time frame on when things are going to get back to normal, whatever normal is now going to look like. We know despairing times, you and I. Now, we really can sympathize with Mary. Even more to the point, we can truly empathize with her. Here she gone to the tomb grieving over the loss of her closest friend. She'd been further disheartened to find that his body was missing from the tomb. In addition to that, she had to now deal with a couple of strangers who were seemingly sticking their noses into her grief. On top of everything else, she was finally so desperate to find Jesus' body that, that she asked one whom she thought was a, a simple gardener to please tell her where the body was. Now, I don't know about you, but it's always struck me in this text how Mary didn't recognize Jesus. I've always thought about that. I've always wondered about that. You know, John's little way that he retells these events, that she had no idea that, that she was not talking to a gardener, that she was talking to Jesus. I've always found that really interesting because obviously Mary knew Jesus very, very well. You know, as we read in the Gospel account, she had basically been, G been with Jesus his entire three-year ministry. She, she wasn't a, an apostle. She wasn't a disciple, one of the twelve. But she was a very close follower. And how was it that she, she could fail to recognize Jesus who was standing right in front of her? Now, some have suggested that, well, maybe she didn't recognize Jesus because he was now outfitted with his glorified body. Well, maybe, but of course, further on in, in Scripture, we read of Jesus appearing to others, and they recognized him for who he was. So maybe, perhaps it was more so that, that Mary was just so filled with grief and despair that she couldn't see Jesus. But whatever it was, the scales fell off of her eyes when this would-be gardener says just one word to her, just mentions her name, Mary. And in that instant, her eyes were opened. And she cries out, Teacher! And she falls down at his feet and, and she worships him. And then at his request, she goes back and she, she tells the disciples and she spreads the good news. I have seen the Lord, she cries. But this time with tears of joy. You see, in one instant, Jesus changed Mary's night into day. In one instant, Jesus changed even Mary 
herself. And now she was no longer just a, an ignorant bystander to the, the greatest event this world has ever known. But now she was an eyewitness to the grace and the power and the love of God. Now she had a story to tell. Friends, Easter was a day that changed everything. It certainly did for Mary. There's no doubt about that from our text. And the fact of the matter is, Easter continues to be a day that changes everything. It's a day that explodes with joy for all of those, no matter how deep our despair. It explodes with joy for all of those who recognize Jesus as the living Lord. It's a day that guarantees life, life now and life forever with the one who is alive forevermore. It's a day that shouts of hope, a hope that is rooted in the reality of God's victory over sin and death and even the devil himself. As one person poetically put it, he said, God played at chess with the devil, and the pieces were human beings. The devil was ahead until God became one of the pieces. Check, said the devil at Golgotha. Three days later, God replied, checkmate. You see, this is the hope that comes your way when you are a child of God. It is a sure and certain confidence to know that out of Christ's brokenness and death comes life. And life not just for himself, but life for absolutely anyone who claims his promises as their own and confesses him as their only Savior and their only Lord. It's a life that so powerfully transforms absolutely anyone into a living and breathing witness of God's power and of God's grace and of God's love. It's a life that gives us a story to tell. And oh, what a story it is. Friends, Easter changes everything. And don't think even for a moment that Easter is just another feel-good holiday and, and another excuse just to, to get together perhaps with some family or even in your own home and maybe have an Easter egg hunt or maybe eat some ham. No, Easter is all about God's power to transform death to life, despair to hope, and grief to joy. All in the name of Jesus the one who died, and the one who is alive again, and the only one who offers life and hope and joy. This is the Jesus we celebrate today. This is the Jesus we celebrate Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. This is the Jesus that his followers are called to proclaim every day. This is the Jesus who changed the world. Has this Jesus changed you? Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for Easter. Thank you for raising your son from the dead. Thank you for soundly defeating death and sin and the devil. Thank you for the life you grant to those who believe. Life now and life forever with you. Help us, each one of us, Lord Jesus, to hear you speaking our name today into our despair, into our hopelessness, into our uncertainty, especially now. Open our eyes to really 
see you in all of your resurrection glory, the only Savior and the only Lord. And help us to spread the good news, to share the story you've given to us. In a special way today, allow that good news to penetrate deep into the hearts of those in the world around us, that they too would experience the true joy of Easter. Bless them, we pray, and bless us too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm so very grateful that we had the opportunity to worship together like this today. I trust that next year we'll look very different, that we'll be back together on Easter Sunday. I already look forward to that. But I trust that you will have a wonderful day today celebrating God's victory and the victory that he gives to us by grace through faith in Jesus. We're going to close in just a moment. We're going to hear another song, Living Hope. You can come on up and get ready for that. But right before we do, I want to give us all God's parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us, and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen.